Okay, I want to go back to something that I mentioned at the beginning of this chapter, which is this presumption that some people have that if your contract is not memorialized in a formal writing signed by both parties, and in some cases maybe you think that it has to have a lot of pages and it has to have a lot of details and a lot of uh, boilerplate language to be official, that's actually not the general rule. You can have oral contracts, uh, generally, that are based on your oral discussions and your oral, oral agreement. That's the general rule, that you can you can have those. The requirement that a contract be in writing is actually part of an exception that we call the statute of frauds, and it pertains to six specific types of contracts that deal with six different types of subject matter. That's the exception to where, with those types of contracts, a court will not enforce the contract unless you put it into writing. And it's called the statute of frauds because the idea behind these uh, re this requirement for these these types of contracts is that these um, these uh, types of contracts would be more susceptible to fraud um, if they were left if we were allowed to, to let people try to enforce them based on um, simply what somebody said uh, without any uh, further documentation. So that's what I'm going to move into now with the next slide and discuss when. We do have to have them in writing. Here we go, the statute of frauds. You see there the list of six. These are the types of contracts that must be in writing for a court to enforce them. If you simply have an oral agreement, a court won't help you. There are six I'm going to go through. Um, I'm going to focus on a couple in particular that I want you to make sure you remember. But for the, the whole list, you can remember them with an acronym that you see at the bottom there called My Legs, M Y L E G S. Um, and that stands for, and you can see it underlined in each line marriage, year, land, executor, goods, and surety agreements. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on each one of those. The main thing I need you to know, I need you to understand, even if you forget to look at, even if you forget all of these you know, what this complete list is comprised of, I want you to, to know that there is this list of the statute of frauds that tells you, will tell you which of the contracts that you make will have to be in writing before they're enforceable. One, promises in consideration of marriage. Um, this is going to be your prenuptial agreement, and most states, I believe, are, already have a statute that says they won't enforce uh, prenuptial agreements with, unless they're in writing. And you can see why that would be at, at the time of divorce, why one party would have reason to um, mislead or, to, or lie to a court about what was promised to them by the spouse that they're not having a, a big dispute with. Number two, performances that will take longer than a year. If it's say, a construction project that's going to take you know, anywhere from three to five years, for instance, that's going to take longer than a year. So a court's not going to enforce it unless you take the time to put it all down into writing. Um, and, and part of that's because you're probably going to have a lot of details that need to be uh, stipulated, and we want to make sure we have good proof of all that was required because it is such a long-term contract. The sale or transfer of land, anything regarding land, real estate, must be in writing. So um, that would be, of course, your deed of, of when you buy land or sell land that uh, shows evidence to a court that it was properly transferred. Um, number four, the exec executor contracts to pay the debts of an estate. Number five, the sale of goods are $500 or more. This is one I want you to definitely keep in mind as we move into the next chapter because the next chapter is all about goods contracts. And those are all going to need to be in a proper form of writing. And what that is in, with goods contracts is a little different, as you'll see, than what is required for a service contract. But... Um, as long as it's worth $500 or more, it's going to have to be in writing before a court, court will enforce it. And when you're talking about businesses and goods contracts, you, you're probably mostly going to be dealing with larger contracts. So it's for practical purposes, all of your contracts in that area will have to be in writing to be enforceable. And then surety agreements, promises to pay the debt of another. Um, so these are all the agreements that um, must be in writing to be enforceable. Anything else outside of this, um, you can have an oral agreement to, 
Uh, you can have an oral agreement between you and the other party. Practically speaking, though, you want all of your contracts to be in writing for, for evidence purposes, right? You don't want to have to rely on, you don't want to be in the situation where you're testifying about what he, somebody else said on some, you know, some six months ago. Uh, it's just much harder to prove your case and also just the, the specific terms. Uh, it makes more sense to have documentation of that. So the best practice is certainly to always have all your agreements in writing. And, um, uh, but just know, and importantly, is that you, you need to, part of the reason you need to know this is that you may be in a situation where somebody's kind of screwed you out of something. And I don't want you to be under the impression that just because you didn't have a writing, that there's absolutely no recourse uh, for you. Or let somebody tell you, well, I didn't put it in writing, so I can do what I want. Um, if it's a, a contract that falls under the statute of frauds, then they're probably right. But outside of that, uh, you still can hold people liable for oral agreements. If, again, the other elements of a contract are there, offer acceptance and consideration. Now, what has to be in this writing under the statute of frauds? Not much, just the material terms to the contract, basically what it is you're exchanging, what is a consideration. So I'm going to sell a piece of land. Um, there was a case, I can't remember the name of it for a second, or many of the other details, but there was a case... Um, I remember reading where two guys had, uh, two friends were at a bar, and they were drinking, and one of them wanted to sell the other his farm and agreed to. And they wrote, he wrote the contract down on a napkin, which is important because it's, a, it's land, so it has to be in writing. Um, statute of frauds doesn't say it has to be on parchment paper or look fancy, it just has to be written down. And it has to contain the material terms of the contract. And in this case, he wrote enough to describe what land he was going to sell and what he was, you know, what the other consideration was, which in this case was the price his friend was going to pay him. And then the statute of frauds says the only other thing you need is that it must be signed by the party to be charged. Now, what that means is that only the party to be charged is the person that you're trying to get a court to enforce it against, the party who's gone against what you perceive your agreement to be. So only one party needs to sign it. And that's the party that you're going to sue. So in that case, I believe, um, I may be mixing this up with another one, but I believe it was just the guy who was selling the farm had just signed this little napkin with the terms of the agreement on it. And because he signed it and he was the person who reneged on the agreement the next morning, uh, it was enough because it had the material terms and it was signed by the party to be charged. Uh, in this case, the guy who was selling the property. Okay, this gets us to the parole evidence rule. This deals with when we can and cannot use oral evidence, uh, conversations that occur about the contract that aren't contained in the actual written agreement. So this comes into play when you have a written agreement, whether your contract is put down in writing because, because of the statute of frauds or it's just because you chose to do it because it's good practice. Once you have a written agreement, we have a specific rule about when you can use outside discussions that fall outside the, what we say, the four corners of the actual document. When can you use that to, uh, if at all, to contradict or change what's in the written agreement? So somebody, you know, your written agreement says one thing, and then as you go on performing it, the guy that you contracted with, he then says something else. He says, well, you know, I don't, it's okay. We do it a little differently than the writing says. When can you use that to then enforce it against the person, what they've said, um, when it, when it uh, isn't, set, isn't stated in the written agreement it's, itself? In that evidence, we call parole evidence. It essentially means oral evidence. Uh, again, evidence outside of, uh, evidence of discussions that out, are, are um, not t articulated in the writing itself. And the rule is, if you have a written agreement, you cannot use parole evidence if it is being used to contradict, to add to, or change what's in the writing. So once you put something down to writing, a court expects you to, whatever it is you need to hold on to, whatever it is you need, um, whatever terms you expect to be in there, whatever ambiguities you want to clear up, you need to do it... Um, uh, in the written agreement. 
Now I said ambiguities. Um, that's a bit of a I shouldn't have said that because there's there are situations where you can actually explain some ambiguities in the contract, and that's that's when you can use parole evidence. But if you're using it to add something that's not in the written agreement or change something that's in there or to contradict something that's in there, you cannot use it uh, because we expect that when parties have completed their written agreement that they've gotten everything, that it states their true agreement, and um, that's the best evidence of that, and that's what we the court expects to be able to rely on.